Okay, so uh, uh, let me uh, start by this picture here, uh, which I drew a little break so I can try to get it right. Um, so the question is, is what is what does this represent? And um, so for a lot of people in the audience, um, they might say right away that oh, this is this is one of the first things that's drawn to describe the mirror, the mirror network. Okay, um, but um, but um, but there's another possibility: is a wavelet decomposition, and the third thing is a holographic mapping. The holographic mapping illustrating the ADS CFT correspondence. <clears throat> and so the answer is that this, uh, this sort of mapping applies, or this sort of diagram applies to uh, all three. And so it's a very interesting uh, connection between these areas. And uh, one that hasn't been uh, appreciated too much before. And uh, the, the, you can draw the same diagram for each of these areas, but the, the way you talk about it and the systems that they're applied to are quite different. So for instance, when we're talking about uh, the MIRA network, you know, we tend to talk about using this to satisfy log corrections to the area law. Um, so different ways of, of having a finite bond dimension that uh, uh, gives you log corrections with the length of the system. Um, you talk about the uh, disentanglers removing short range entanglement. Okay, so here's a disentangler. Um, and you talk about uh, trying to set up uh, a renormalization group transformation that can exhibit scale invariance with a, a, a tensor network. Okay, in a, the wavelet decomposition language, we talk about quite different things. So we talk about a uh, sort of compromise between real space and K space. Uh, we talk about things like completeness and basis sets. Uh, let's see, we talk about sort of the uh, uncertainty principle in the presence of orthogonality. So the, the wavelet stuff I'm going to, it's going to be the focus of my talk because that's sort of the area that's probably least familiar, familiar to most people. So I'm going to focus on this. Uh, Frank? Yeah, I so, so. Is there, when you talk about wavelets, is there a tensor block structure there, or is that the difference? That's what I'm going to talk about. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so people, I think, for the most part, have not appreciated this uh, th this sort of connection with wavelets. Wavelets are a thing that I've thought about quite a bit because I have a sort of computational orientation, and so I've thought about things like what's the best way to do the quantum mechanics for a many electron system uh, going back to the continuum and using basis sets. And so wavelets have a, a clear connection to making basis sets that uh, are used to set up your quantum system. Not taking it as a lattice that's given, but going back and representing it uh, with some uh, basis that, that, that represents the continuum. And so I thought about wavelets for a long time in terms of how, you, how can you set up this problem better from a computational point of view. Uh, and uh, so from that point of view, this uh, sort of connection to Mira sort of came along um, at some point. And so that's mostly what I'm going to be talking about. Um, but uh, uh, let's, so let me go on. The, uh, the uh, holographic mapping, what you talk about here, is um, sort of the geometry and uh, defining distances. <coughs> and I didn't realize this connection until recently when I saw a preprint of Xiaoling Qi's 
work. And so Xiao Lang is going to be talking about this. And so you can think about, uh, I'm not going to say too much of, about um, the holography except sort of illustrate a little bit about how the diagrams relate to this. But, but you can think of it as a, a bit of a warm up for later talks. I don't know how Brian Swingle's talk will relate to what I'm saying, but uh, a warm up where I'm going to be talking about the sort of simplest point of view, um, the wavelet point of view, which is really quantum mechanics of a single particle in 1D, which we think we all understand pretty well, I hope. Uh, at least I feel like I can understand that part a lot better than more ab abstract things. So I'm going to try to uh, relate these complicated things back to this simple picture. Um, okay. So uh, let me uh, so let me start in on this connection between uh, mirrors and uh, wavelet decomposition. And so I'm going to switch over now to just talking about um, looking at 1D single particle quantum mechanics. Okay, and so I can think of 1D single particle quantum mechanics both in the continuum and I can think of a grid. So let me draw the grid representation. And so the grid you could just think of, you, you know, you're trying to solve this on the computer and you set up a grid and you write down a discrete kinetic energy and here's the uh, Hamiltonian with just the kinetic energy. Um, so let's first, first write down uh, just the uh, sort of Hubbard type representation, sum on i with a t, c dagger i, c i plus one plus permission conjugate. Okay, but if I go to just a single particle first quantized picture, I'll be thinking about this as a matrix with zeros and along the diagonal and minus t's on the off diagonal. And uh, so I can think about diagonalizing uh, that matrix. So this is both the Hubbard, right? I don't even have to worry about that because I'm never going to have two particles. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so here's this uh, Hamiltonian. And uh, so suppose we want to apply some of these uh, sort of uh, the framework that we're, we think about in terms of DMRG or, or uh, tensor networks to this single particle uh, Hamiltonian. And suppose we want to work in this matrix formulation, first quantize. The first thing that you sort of have to think about a little bit is how do you even do a Schmidt decomposition in terms of just a psi of x. And uh, so let's talk about that. Okay, so uh, we're going to think of a wave function, a single particle wave function, psi, as sum on i equals 1 to n. n is the number of sites in the system, some coefficient psi sub i, c dagger i, 0. Okay, so in order to do the Schmidt decomposition, you need to sort of go briefly out of the first quantized notation where you always have one particle and include the vacuum also. And the point is that if you split the system in two, the particle is either on the left or the right. So the particle's on the right, you need the state for the vacuum on the left. So uh, it's going to be a representation that in, say, matrix product states has m equals 2. And uh, the first state will just be this vacuum piece. Uh, and then we can lump together the other piece here with one particle. So say this goes from 1 to L as sum i equals 1 to L, psi i, c dagger i, 0. And I can call that state L. <clears throat> so, uh, so these <clears throat> are sufficient to represent the wave function in sort of this slightly many particle framework over here. You have 0, and you have a similar thing, r, on the right that sums over the wave function coefficients on the right. Okay? And then you can write the wave function now as the vacuum, say, for the left part and the right state plus the left state and then the vacuum for the right part. And uh, from this, you can write down the Schmidt decomposition right away. 
Uh, you can put this into a matrix form where you have zero. And then all, if you want to write out all the possible one particle states, you can put psi one here, psi two, et cetera. These are all the two particle states. So we'll leave those zero. And then along here, we have the states on the right, psi L plus one. <clears throat> okay, and so we can form a reduced density matrix for the left hand side, and we get a row which is essentially just, um, well, there's a zero part, and then there's a L uh, cross L here. Okay. So, so this is how we can do the uh, Schmidt decomposition. The key thing is that you get just this outer product of the vector L on the other side. And so it's the eigenvectors of the density matrix here are, well, there, there's always the vacuum part that just sort of goes along to make the trace of rho equal to one, but it's really just, oh, and I left off the, this zero is not quite right. It's really the normalization of the right-hand part. So this gives the probability that the particle is on the right. Sorry about that. Excuse me. Yeah. So in general, if you separate system two two part, so each part may have a zero or one particle. Mm -hmm. If both parts have a zero or one particle, then at the end you may have a, a two particle states, which is not included in your bit. Right. At your beginning. So right. So uh, I can uh, just imagine that I'm setting up something that could include two particles, but then I'm using it to represent a state that doesn't have two particles. And then this is the structure that you can see. And so this piece over here has zero in. And so I'm left. And then once I do that, I can go back and just sort of go back to a, a, the world of matrices. And I see that my matrices, uh, if I just have one state, I do this outer product of the, I see. The, the projection of the state into the block that I'm looking at. I see. Okay, so if I have a wave function, now going back to single particle language, and here's psi of x. Okay, and I make a block that I want to do a Schmidt decomposition with respect to. Then I take this little piece of wave function like that, and that's actually the Schmidt vector. There's just one that I need to worry about aside from this vacuum. And so here's a Schmidt state. Okay, so uh, the uh, uh, one of the key features of this, so if you think about doing DMRG in this sort of single particle language, what you end up with is you have blocks and you, you sort of iteratively, iteratively converge to just the right part of the wave function for each block such that you sum them all together and they all fit together precisely to the exact, the exact wave function that you want. So it can work very nicely. Um, you, know, you can make a, a single particle DMRG and you can let it iterate and treat it as a numerical method for solving a, a matrix problem. Um, but it has this pathology in the representation that when you go to the edge of the block, it, you, you, it has a discontinuity. And you don't necessarily notice it at first because your block only has the part where it's non-zero. But if you think about how it fits together, there are kinetic energy pieces that come in your Hamiltonian from connecting this block with the next one. And those kinetic energy pieces, if you try to go to a grid size that uh, goes to zero, say your, your grid spacing is A, then there are kinetic energy terms that come in as one over A. And so you have this sort of residual effect of the grid, grid that you started with, sort of connecting these different blocks. Uh, another way to put it is that you have all energy scales built into the DMRG uh, type of structure. And it prevents you from really thinking of scale invariance where as you renormalize, you go to uh, a system where all the length scales have, have been reduced by some factor. Okay. So the question is, is there something that one can do to get rid of this problem 
of having these sharp edges. And the wavelet approach, one way of thinking about it is it's a way of introducing smoothed out edges so that uh, you have a representation that doesn't have this, this problem. So just like DMRG uh, can work pretty well for systems um, that are critical, power law decay, the, the extra log in the entanglement uh, isn't necessarily going to kill off the DMRG for some sort of reasonable system size, and you can do a good job and try to do finite sa size scaling. But trying to translate that to truly infinite systems, you get this problem. So we're, we're trying to see how, in this single particle language, we can deal with this issue. And it'll turn out that it connects back to the sort of more general thing that you think about with uh, the mirror network. OK, so now let me give you an introduction to the way I think about uh, wavelets, sort of from the very beginning. We'll see how this connects. OK, so I like to think of wavelets as something that uh, you use as a basis set for doing quantum mechanics in long D. OK, so let's imagine that I have a, a grid. and I'm gonna, I could think of doing the quantum mechanics on this grid, but instead I'm gonna say, no, the grid really represents the coefficient of a, of a little basis function set on that site. And so let me draw what these things might look like. Here's one of these little wavelet functions. And so you have one of these functions at every site. Okay, and uh, so you could make a basis set out of this. And if these functions have uh, nice enough properties in terms of completeness, and we'd like to make them orthogonal, then it gives you a nice way of setting up uh, a numerical quantum mechanics problem. Okay, but we're going to think about doing this uh, and uh, trying to implement a renormalization group transformation that takes us to a larger length scale. So. Uh, let me, I should have drawn this one lower, but let me try to draw these functions at, so they, this is length scale A, and here's 2A. And I'm going to try to make these functions with twice the length scale, and think about <coughs> something that, that involves a mapping between those. Sorry, can you, can you go over again? I didn't understand the, how we're supposed to picture this uh, wave function vis-a-vis -vis the, the lattice. Yeah, so, so uh, if I have a wave function that looks like this, but you can say that the C dagger I, instead of creating an electron, say, on one grid point, it creates an electron in a function that, a state that looks like that little orthogonal function sitting on that lattice site. And as long as those are orthogonal, then you have, uh, you know, the, 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 the commutation relations and everything work the same, and I can describe my quantum mechanics this way. Does that, does that address? Yeah, I, I, there must be something I haven't quite understood. So yeah. there's a space here, and this is a function wave. So, so we, you can go a step back from that. So the function is defined where? Uh, so I'm looking at just psi of x, and x is a continuous variable. So I'm trying to go now to the continuum. But I'm only going to look at you know, the, the high frequency parts are suppressed by the kinetic energy. So I'm going to assume that there's just low frequency parts. And so I can have a, a representation with a sort of reduced number of degrees of freedom that is spanned by this set of functions. Okay. So you mean ignore, the, ignore the dots completely? The, the dots will simply represent the centers of the functions. So I'll have a single function s of x that uh, defines this basis, and then I'll have a set of basis functions uh, s of x minus j, where j takes on integer values, or multiples of k. And uh, this is the actual basis set. I thought you also need this uh, state of diversity. Yeah, so there's, so there's a scale. So this, uh, so let's let's make this a little bit better. Let's do s of x over a minus j, and then I won't worry about the normalization. Yeah, I'm sorry, the sorry. If you take a to zero, you will get a delta sitting on each point. Yeah, 
Yeah. So you can think of these these functions that I'm writing down here. Uh, when you construct them well, they actually make very good approximations to delta functions. But the, the, they are a basis set only if you uh, also, also change the data. It's not like yeah. you fix it. So I can think of a particular problem which has some sort of uh, um, cutoff in the pieces of the Hamiltonian that access the high k states. And so there will be some natural grid spacing that I can take as my starting uh, grid spacing. And I'll, I'll say that's a good enough approximation for the continuum. And when you're doing that, you have to worry about the completeness of these functions, how they scale. There's a number of issues that are sort of the key to thinking about uh, how wavelets work in the wavelet language, but we won't deal too much with those. Uh, so then I'll start with that as a starting point, then I'm going to think of going to, I'll, suppose I try, try to implement some renormalization group structure that maps it on to a description with spacing 2a. All the functions are twice as big, and uh, I can think of some renormalization group transformation that takes me from the space of a to the space of 2a. Now, I'm going to think about the wavelets, though, as a renormalization group transformation on the functions themselves. So I'm going to say the functions at the next scale, I'm not going to say at first that they are the same as the functions at the shorter length scale. I'm going to say that they're the linear combination of those functions. Okay, so I'm going to assign a level. So I'm going to call this level L. And this is level L plus 1. And I'm going to say that S of L, S L of X is root 2 sum on K C K S L plus 1 of 2X minus K, where here I've taken the scale factor A equal to 1 for the uh, uh, for, for L. Okay, so this is uh, sort of writing this function at. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Steve. Yeah. So just just to clarify, right now it's just a single part. Yes. And so is it? This is just preliminary to where you want to go to, or, is it, or just to orient us on what where you. Okay. Are so so what I'm trying to do is uh, talk about this part of single particle quantum mechanics and writing basis functions and it gives you wavelets that is you know really really just as a very simple thing because it's one particle but it has these connections to much more complicated things but so the idea is that we want to try to really understand how all this works in one particle language this is this was sort of the key uh, the key progress that led to the development of DMRG sort of take a renormalization group uh, real space and say, well, this doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Why don't we try to understand it for a single particle? And uh, it turned out that, that that wasn't, you know, Wilson wasn't able to find the way uh, to really solve that problem uh, or in the, even in the single particle language. So these single particle languages are, can be very useful. Uh, we can really understand them in more detail. And so that's what I'm trying to get to here. And then I'll worry about the connections uh, to more complicated things a little bit later on. Yeah? So it seems <clears throat> that, like in the single particle model, that single particle can be anywhere, like on the line. Right. Whereas, like in the spin glass model, the particles are fixed to certain points. Right. So it seems, at least on the surface, or that there is no connection. But So you are saying that, nevertheless, there is some yeah. Okay. So if you're if you're used to thinking of spin models, um, you know the of course spin models we think in condensed matter physics as them arising from electrons in in lo local orbitals. And so there's that, that sort of connection. There are other connections that talk about spin models when you have say one uh, spin that's flipped relative to a, a polarized background. Uh, but the but the actual spin degree problems are, are much more complicated than what I'm talking about. Okay, <clears throat> okay so this uh, gives a, uh, a definite, this is the, the basic uh, relationship between the functions at the smaller length scale to the functions 
at the larger light scale. And it's all just purely uh, functions in one dimension. And this is sort of the first equation that, that you get in, say, something like this in, say, the numerical recipes treatment of uh, wavelets. So the, the, simpler, so the, the transformation that takes you from these functions here up to this function here, there, um, are defined by these coefficients ck. And uh, the uh, and so function. What, what are the subscripts L on these S's now? These are different functions S? Yes. <coughs> so, at, so eventually I'm going to get to where I'll only look at a fixed point function. And so that the functions at SL and SL plus 1, except for a scale change, are the same function. But more generally, you can talk about the functions as just starting with some arbitrary function at the fine scale, and then doing the renormalization group transformation to get functions at the larger scales. And I'm defining my renormalization group transformation by this set of coefficients C sub k. That will have a fixed point, and, uh, and when people talk about wavelets and scaling functions from a wavelet transformation, it's really the fixed point determined by a set of C sub k's. And then you say, what's, what are the ideal choices of C sub k's that give me nice functions to use for various properties, such as having optimal localization in both real space and momentum space with no funny artifacts and with uh, completeness. OK. So, so basically, we have some linear combination of these uh, short scale functions that make a large scale function. And the simplest sort of example of this, uh, often the most useful ones that have a finite set of C sub k's. So there's something called a Haar wavelet transformation, the transform. that has C0 equal 1 over root 2, and C1 equals 1 over root 2. And so it only has two non-zero coefficients, and it just sums up two local functions uh, to make the function on the next scale. And you can imagine that if you sum up just two local functions with zero coefficients, it'll tend to be flatter than the original function, it'll look like a little box function. And then the fixed point, will turn out to look just to be just a box like that. Okay, this is uh, sort of the simplest uh, thing in the wavelet family, family, and it doesn't have very nice properties because it has these discontinuous edges. Okay, but now let me introduce a uh, uh, sort of tensor network style diagram. Sorry, so the fixed fix point just means the effect by the equation. Yes. So uh, basically stick in SL equals SL plus 1. So the hard have exactly the ground that you have on the right one there. Sorry, we'll love you. The hard basis has exactly the ground. Exactly. Exactly. So the, the HAR is it's been known a long time. It's not uh, it's just a sort of example of the easiest thing you can do. Okay, but if we look uh, there's a diagram that we can describe here, a tree diagram. It looks like this. Okay, so here's C0 and C1, C0 and C1, C0 and C1. Okay, so when we uh, look at, so here we have the set of functions that say SL. And then we form the set of functions at the higher level, L plus 1, by taking the specific linear combinations of each pair of functions like this. So, so we think of a diagram here where this uh, little unit here just represents C0, C1. And it takes the specific linear combination of these two functions. So, when we draw these diagrams for wavelets, we're no longer thinking of the, the structure of our space as being a product space. We're thinking of it as being a direct sum space. And so we, we think of just psi sub i, psi 1, just sort of living on the bottom here like this. 
Okay, then after we do this transformation, we can uh, write a reduced description of this that has, say, a psi prime 1, psi prime 2, psi prime 3, etc. And uh, uh, so another, uh, so it looks like all of these have the dimension of each of these bonds in the first quantized language is m equals 1. So if you do a mirror, if you do a, in a product space, uh, m equals 1, it's a completely trivial uh, uh, diagram. But if you do it in this direct sum space, it just has the sort of interpretation in terms of single particle quantum mechanics. And then uh, we can think about a, what's going to be crucial is uh, something that I'll draw as this. And this is going to be, uh, down here are going to be the rows. And here's the columns. And this is going to be a 2 by 2 matrix, which um, I'll make normally have unitary. So cosine theta, sine theta, cosine theta, and minus sine theta. OK, so within the space of single particle functions living on two sites, here's the most general unitary operation. It doesn't appear in this network yet. Uh, but I'll, I'll come to that later. So, so far the network has just transformed from this level L description up to L plus 1. And then if I continue this to higher levels, it makes a tree. And eventually you get a description of this function in terms of just sort of one, uh, one function at the top, which is uh, just described. In this case, there's no degrees of freedom, so it would just be described by uh, the, the structure of these C0 and C1. OK. <clears throat> so. So I'm trying to, at this, at, so, for, so these functions are called scaling functions. And what I'm going to do next is introduce the wavelet. The scaling function is designed to capture the low energy, low frequency part of these functions. And then what's left over is the wavelet. And they're supposed to be orthogonal. Okay, so, so uh, naturally if I only allow the coefficients to live on two sites, then I choose them equally weighted to get the best low frequency part. Okay, so now the, the wavelet is a different function that's defined with an expression like this. So WL of x is root 2 sum on k, c tilde k as L plus 1 of 2x minus k. Let's see, do I have the, uh, I think I have the uh, L and L plus 1 backwards. Let's see, no, no, sorry. I've got it labeled the way I want right here. Okay, so I, I'm not sure if I've mixed up which one's the larger scale, but I'm going to use that. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this C tilde sub K is C of 1 minus K minus 1 to the K. Okay, so this is uh, almost always the choice that's made for C tilde K. And what this does is it makes the, uh, um, the, the function WL orthogonal to the function SL. So if you calculate WL of X, SL of X, okay, and uh, we can look at this either for um, this L being the same as that L. But the first thing is just to take the same one and uh, make this transformation orthogonal. Then you find that this is equal to 0 by this choice. Uh, and that's a simple thing to work out, but I'll skip it. OK, so what the wave functions, what these wavelets look like, just to give you a feel, is uh, if you if you go to the more so this this equation applies in general even if the number of coefficients is a lot is bigger than this so this is the simplest thing but normally we might have ten or twenty 
non-zero coefficients. What the wavelets sort of typically look like is here's an S of X. And a wavelet will tend to look like something like that. So uh, for instance, the uh, integral of the wavelet is always 0. And uh, it's guaranteed to be orthogonal to this. They tend to be shifted uh, by half a spacing relative to the uh, wavelet, uh, to the scaling function. And uh, so that's a wavelet. So if you, if you introduce the wavelets, uh, you can modify your tree diagram to include the wavelets. And all of a sudden, it's not truncating anything at all. So, so first of all, you can, so the, let me say what the fixed point is. OK, so the fixed point is only applied to the function s. You say sl equals sl plus 1. So in other words, if you start this iteration with a sufficiently complete and broad function, uh, and then uh, for your starting function, and then go up to larger and larger scales, uh, generally you'll uh, converge to a fixed point, and that'll correspond to SL equals S plus L plus 1, and maybe it looks something like this function. Then the wavelet function is defined in terms of that fixed point. So you have S of x is root 2 sum on k ck s of 2x minus k. And then w of x is defined in terms of the s of k's as root 2 sum on k c tilde k s of 2x minus k. OK, so the fixed point is only done on the scaling function. Then at each stage, you take the piece that you would have thrown away in the renormalization group transformation, and you take this orthogonal piece, and you use that's the, wave, the wavelet. OK, so if we have this tree diagram, but then we pay attention to what the wavelets are doing, the wavelets, yeah. So the c tilde k is this. Just one scale? Also in the, in the case when k goes to much larger Yes, k? yes. So uh, we, we can write this out. Uh, you know, it's just like in the, in the case of uh, a, a dimension 2 set of c's, you're just swapping it and Sorry. putting in a minus sign. The neat little trick here is that it works if you do it this way uh, for an arbitrarily long <coughs> vector. You can just work it out. Sorry, can you say that the ck and the c tilde k would be orthogonal vectors? Too? Yes. Yes, define them, think of them as running over the infinite set of uh, values, and but being mostly 0 in most places. And then use this, and then you get two orthogonal vectors. And so then so you can just show that that's uh, uh, orthogonal. <coughs> OK, so the wavelet here, here is designed to pick up the piece that was thrown away in the scale in the, this RG transformation. So we can write it as an extra piece that comes off here. And so up here, this guy describes the scaling function, and this is the wavelet. And if you do that, then these, uh, let's see, the uh, little elements of the diagram are just these matrices. So guy here we define as C S minus S C where C is the cosine of theta and S is the sine of theta. Okay, so uh, what what we're doing here when we if we draw this diagram and then we say we're only interested in one of the uh, pieces of it. So for the part that goes up to the next scale, we're only taking the low frequency part, and in this diagram that's the right hand line. So I sort of uh, tie off this guy so it doesn't come in. And then I just have um, a diagram that uh, only has one vector at each stage. OK, so in this language, what we have is 
a little unitary matrix. And in the matrix language are one row of this tensor network has actually looked like a set of two by two matrices applied to our vector. So the transformation representing a whole row of these or a whole row of these guys looks like these little C, S, minus S, C, where all the thetas are taken to be the same. And what's the rule, how you find theta? Sorry? Theta, the angle, how you find it? Yes. <coughs> okay, so the, uh, the angle theta now is defining our, it, it generates our wavelet transform coefficients. So you can do thing, two things. One is if you, if someone else is, has chosen wavelet uh, coefficients that have particularly nice properties, then you can back out the angle from the choice. Or you can go the other way and say, I can define a broad family of wavelet transformations uh, based on the angles theta. And it turns out that the angles theta are a particularly compact representation of wavelets. That it, uh, as far as we know, um, the wavelet community doesn't really appreciate that you can just define these wavelets in terms of um, sets of little gates with one angle. And then uh, I'll get to the, you know, to, to define wavelets more generally, um, we're going to put shifted gates on top of these. And you'll have a set of angles that define an orthogonal wavelet with sort of very broad generality. As far as we can tell, these, you know, if you do Google, uh, so, so Glenn Evenbly has been playing around with some of this uh, with me. And, and if you do, if you take the simplest wavelet and you calculate what the theta angles have to be to generate that wavelet, and you Google search for just those numerical values, you don't find anything. So that's uh, an argument that uh, this little network sort of description, these, these little diagram description of wavelet generation doesn't seem to be known. <laughs> it's a funny sort of way of doing things. Okay, so the, let me say a little bit about more uh, so the the case where okay. So suppose we had a uh, wavelet with four scenes. And the most famous wavelet is actually one of these types. It's called the Dabashay So there's a Dabashay wavelet, E4, that has coefficients The vector of C's is 1, 8, 1 minus root 3, 3 minus root 3, 3 plus root 3, and 1 plus root 3, describing C minus 1 up to C2. Okay, so this particular wavelet is sort of the first type that gets rid of the discontinuity in the fixed point. So the fixed point for this first example looks like that. <coughs> this function generated by this has no discontinuities, although it sort of looks like a fractal, fractal sort of shape. And you've probably seen plots of this. Let me see if I can. <coughs> it looks something like that with little uh, slope, uh, uh, sort of bad behavior at the slope when you go to the fixed point. Okay. But uh, so suppose we want to look at this uh, wavelet transform of, uh, defined by these functions and say, what is the uh, network that represents that? Well, the, because the, the C's stick out uh, four spaces, uh, but the uh, wavelets are only spaced apart two spaces, they overlap. So you get something that looks like this. Uh, but then you have to have another one that looks like this. 
Okay, so the tensor network diagram in terms of directly writing down these C's, when you make them longer, doesn't look so nice. Okay, so but I we can, ask, yeah. So, so that's, that's the shape of, there, aren't there four, when you say there are four C's, does that mean there are four different functions or is it one function shifted? <coughs> one function shifted. Okay. Yeah, so, so all I'm saying is that the, in order to go the mapping to the, broad, the, the larger scale level, you add up pieces of four different wave functions for each one. Same function. Okay. So there's only one function at each level, and then at the fixed point, there's only one scale function of all. And the form uh, has compacts and four. Right. I mean, this is single after the four. Right. Otherwise, the Shannon one we already right. really nice, better, better than that. Right. So this, this, this you get. It still has compact support in space. It has better behavior in momentum space, but still not very good behavior in momentum space. Okay. So you can generate this. So you just got C C tilde C, right? Right now. Uh, C tilde was the thing that was described in the wavelet. Yeah. Okay. So. This is. C. I think C. Okay, so, so you see, I don't understand your picture. Why did you draw this other thing on top of it? Right, so the, if, you, if you try directly to, to make, so, so you say, what, how do you generate each wavelet uh, out of the guys beneath it? So in this diagram, if I want to generate this one, it, it comes from these four functions. Okay, and this guy comes from here over from these four functions, but there's another one in the middle that comes from functions that overlap. So it doesn't fit in very well with the, uh, you know, this. And somehow you want these, the functions here, so they're, they're, this guy comes up here. And, and this is orthogonal to the other two ones. And they're orthogonal, okay. but it's not apparent from the diagram. It, it's an awkward construction when viewed this way. Okay, but if we go over to this mirror type network, uh, it arises more naturally. Okay, so we actually construct this, this guy as <clears throat> as this um, extra little piece of uh, the Mira network. So what we do, we think of starting with functions that live locally on one site for the most part. And then we apply this little unitary to the functions. And what does that unitary do? It smears out those functions over the two sites. And uh, so if we might start out with these states look like that, or and that, or that. But we're going to smear them out a little bit with this cosine sine, and so that they look like this, and uh, sorry this. So the CS and minus SC. Okay, so that's going to do a unitary transformation so that when we access this guy here, we get, we're accessing a function that's a little bit smeared out. And uh, so if we, uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, so then we take these two functions. So the, this is guaranteed to keep your transformation unitary, okay, and then we apply this, uh, which is an isometry, and, and it keeps uh, the properties of the system, or we can keep track of the wavelet, and then this is just a unitary transformation. Uh, so the question is, you know, in, in sort of thinking about one particle language, what are we trying to do with this? So if we chose theta equal to zero, it does nothing. We choose theta equal to 45 degrees, it goes completely to a sort of k-space representation like that. And uh, what you want to do with these is smear things out a little bit, but sort of keep a compromise between k-space and real space. And so, for instance, if you do theta equals 30 degrees, you get something that looks like this, that sort of smears out the functions, gets rid of the sort of edge discontinuity, but still keeps them relatively local. Uh, so it turns out that if you 
Uh, so there's uh, this representation can generate this uh, sort of wave function quite nicely. So if you uh, choose, it turns out that the optimal ch the choice that gives you this uh, special D4 wavelet is just theta equals 30 degrees. And then um, the theta prime, I can take the next level as defined by a C prime and a S prime. And there's a theta that generates that. And that's equal to the tangent inverse of cosine theta minus sine theta over cosine theta plus sine theta. And this condition guarantees that if the, the, the scaling function represents a constant function. Okay, so this touches on completeness. So when you're, you're talking about wavelets, uh, there's a nice way to think about uh, the completeness of the functions. So we think about the completeness of the functions as if you take the full set of functions at one level, can you represent a polynomial to a given order exactly? <clears throat> and uh, so we talk about polynomial com completeness, and uh, so the D4 generates this, these, this combination of functions will set any uh, will represent any linear function exactly. So it has co completeness through constant functions and um, and, and uh, x. Okay, so this particular choice will generate uh, with these two angles this uh, d4 wavelet. If you want to go, so the simplest sort of mirror network in 1D is the one I've drawn there, and there are various elaborations. But the ones that take you up to that represent uh, wavelets at higher and higher uh, number of Cs just have more levels of these unitary gates. So if I do this, okay, do another level. And I can keep going and do more and more levels. <clears throat> okay, and then you look, in, in Miro we talk about sort of the causality uh, cone. In the, the same thing applies here for uh, the wavelets. So up here are these sets of wavelets and scaling functions. Say this one is a scaling function. So if you set all of these to zero, and you set the one here, you'll sort of map out how far the wavelet goes, and you'll get a function that's defined on these set of sort of lower level functions, and you can make them extend out arbitrarily far. Okay, so this uh, suggests sort of the first sort of insight that you might transfer back from uh, from this sort of wavelet thing over to thinking about how to make mirror type networks is, well, maybe we should be thinking about multiple levels of these disentangler gates to sort of smooth things out further. So when you do it at the just the lowest level, the standard mirror type uh, diagram, if you translate to what the fixed point looks like in real space, it still isn't so well behaved. It's very nicely compact in uh, space, but it uh, is, uh, still has in K space sort of lots of singularities. So if you allow the function to spread out more, you can get uh, better behavior. Okay. Uh, so let me say just a little bit uh, about this holography connection. Okay, so uh, what you'll hear later on in the conference is that if we look at this diagram and we think about the degrees of freedom, so this, first of all, this diagram represents a unitary transformation. It's a unitary transformation starting from these degrees of freedom, and it re-represents something in terms of all of these little 
degrees of freedom that stick out here. Okay, going up. Uh, so you can think about this as a mapping from something in one dimension up to this two-dimensional thing where the uh, distance is doing something funny. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> so basically the, the distance scale is sort of scrunching up. And we can think of this uh, uh, distance, this direction here is going up in scale. And so people like Brian Swingle have been talking about this and, and uh, he'll talk later in the conference and uh, I don't know how it'll connect exactly to what I'm saying. But this sort of picture of mapping from uh, here a one dimensional system to something with an extra uh, uh, geometrical dimension that those is scaling, this is this connection to a holographic mapping. And uh, so you can think of this uh, stuff that, this simple stuff that I'm doing with wavelets is sort of a, a way to get uh, maybe some intuition about these, uh, these more complicated uh, things to think about. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so the, the key thing that I want to get out of this is what can we think about in terms of this specific, so wavelets are a, a very big deal in numerical analysis. Um, you know, they, they produce surprising results that surprise the field and uh, they've been very useful as a practical tool. So now we have this connection with this practical tool to some of the uh, tensor network things that we've been thinking about. And so the key thing that we want to try to get out of this is some sort of insight uh, into uh, how might we do um, tensor networks better by thinking about this. Okay, so that's it.